Today is my last episode of Timber Tuesday for the year 2022, and I thought I would bring you my best 15 wood spindle decor ideas. Hi there, my name is Sandra, and you're watching The Schwoven's Nest. I found this garden stake windmill last year in the summertime at my dollar store and I'm just going to take it apart. I'm not going to be using the stakes for it. I just want the top windmill portion. I got a package of these spindles. I got 16 of them for 20 bucks and I thought that was a great buy off of Facebook Marketplace. But what I need to do with this is just cut it down a little wee bit. So I'm just going to use my miter box and my handsaw and go ahead and trim it down where I want it to be. I use 60 or 80 grit sandpaper a lot when I'm distressing because it makes quick work of getting down to the bare wood if that's what you want to do. And for this project, I definitely do. I want to get a lot of that bare wood showing through. I want this to look really old and weathered and it turned out perfect. My idea for this project is to have the windmill at the top of the spindle. So I'm drilling a hole all the way down through the spindle itself that's a little bit wider than the bolt I'm going to be using. So I'm just using a good amount of pressure here and getting through all the way nice and clean. This is a two by four that I'm gonna use for the base of this windmill. I did drill a hole into this as well, a little bit smaller than the size of screw that I'm using. And I'm making sure that as I screw this in, I leave a little bit on the other side. That's just going to make it easier for me to find the hole on the bottom of the spindle. And then I'll be able to screw these both together. Now I had to do that off screen because of course this is really tall but you can see here what I'm going to attempt to do. The two pieces are together really nice and secure so I'm just going to go around that two by four with some white chalk paint and give it a couple of coats so then I can distress that up a little bit later and it will match the spindle. In between working on the spindle I had taken this outside and given it a couple of coats of flat white spray paint. Now I'm taking a kitchen sponge which seems to be my most favorite way to distress things lately and I'm using some gray paint and I'm just going to be going around the edges a little bit. I want this to look like it's old and weathered and that some of the paint on the edges is starting to come off. Then I just put everything together and it spins. I was so excited that it actually spins. So this would look beautiful on a front porch or in a garden, but I will be keeping this in the house. And since I've got 15 more spindles, I'll be on the hunt for more of these windmill pieces. I'm going to start this project by gluing these two pieces together. This is just a two by four that's been cut square and this is a spindle from a bed. I had already painted it for a different project but now I'm going to repurpose it for this one. I'm using my favorite weld bond glue to glue these together. It holds within about 10 minutes. It needs about 24 hours to cure completely. It's really important to prep any pieces that you want to paint, especially if they're shiny. I like to use Rust-Oleum Matte Clear Finish, so I'm going to give this canister one spray all the way around, and that's just going to help my chalk paint grip better. I'll do the lid too. I purchased a new color of paint. This is the Folk Art Home Decor Chalk Paint in the color Sheepskin. It's a creamy white color, it's really pretty. And I got that instead of getting another chiffon cream, which I love, and that's by Rust-Oleum. But I thought I wanted to try something different, and I really love the coverage of the Folk Art Home Decor Chalk Paint. So I will have those listed down in my description box if you're interested in giving those paints a try. I'm going to give the 2x4 and the little spindle piece two coats of the sheepskin paint. 
Now that the clear mat finish is dry, I can also begin to start painting the canister. Now I'm starting with an up and down brushing motion because I know I'm going to have to do at least two to three coats on this. The stripes and the colors are fairly dark, so I want to make sure I get good coverage. But the reason I'm going up and down is I like to change the direction of my brush strokes with each coat, and that just ensures better coverage. I decided to put a grain sack stripe design on the canister and I've already done one of the thin stripes and I'm just putting the painter's tape on to get ready to paint the second stripe. I'm just using a paintbrush and a very light touch. I'm using a medium gray chalk paint and I'm just going to make sure that I cover it well the first time. I'm not going to do two coats so if a little bit of that bottom color shows through that'll look great. Once I'm done painting, I remove the tape right away because I don't want any of that tape to hang on to the gray paint and then pull it off when it's dry. So it's always a good idea to remove your painter's tape when the paint is still wet. Once the two thin stripes were completely dry, I reapplied the tape and did the thicker stripe in the center. Now I'm taking a small paintbrush and just hand painting number and two with a period in between. And I think that just adds to the farmhouse charm of this canister. If you're not good at doing hand painting, you could definitely use stickers or a Cricut or any rub-on transfers that you can find. I'm just dry brushing a little bit of the sheepskin paint over the lettering and the stripes just so they look a little bit aged as well. I'm also going to be dry brushing the bottom part. I'm going to leave the canister without any dry brushing, but I thought to bring all of the colors together, it would be a good idea to add a little bit of gray to the two by four and the spindle. Now it's time to glue everything together and of course using my weld bond glue one more time I'm going to make sure that I get a decent amount on the spindle and then I'll center it onto my canister and let that set overnight. Did you know there's a bunch of different ways you can support my channel? You can hit that like button. That gets me noticed more on YouTube and they promote my video more when they know it's something you want to see. You can also hit the subscribe button. That helps my channel grow and it also helps my views increase. You could also watch the ads. That's how Google pays me, so I would really appreciate it if you would watch an ad once in a while. And finally, if you want to go that extra step, you can buy me a coffee. For my I've first project, I'm using two sizes of the tumbling tower blocks. The small ones on the right are from the Dollar Tree. These that I'm showing you right now are from Dollarama. I love being able to have different sizes and I also find a whole bunch of them at thrift stores. So if you're ever looking for the original Jenga blocks, go to the thrift store and check out their game section. I'm using the larger wood blocks for this project. And what I'm doing here is using my weld bond glue, which I will have linked down in my description box, and a paintbrush to apply it. I have a really hard time squeezing the glue out of the bottle because I have arthritis in my thumbs and that just makes it really difficult. So I like to just make it easy for myself and paint the glue on. I'm gonna go ahead and put two together and then I'm going to assemble more and more until I get a square the size that I want. What I love about the weld bond glue is that it only takes a few minutes for it to actually take. It's not going to dry 100% in about 10 minutes but it does dry enough that you can continue working with your project and you don't have to add any hot glue. I like working in sections like this but you could also just have a ruler set up and then just glue one on top of each other and just continue until you get the size you like. 
I did set this aside for a little bit to fully dry and now I'm going to be adding a stain to it. I'm just using burnt umber acrylic paint and you saw me squirt some water in there. I'm just going to use one of my little brushes. I'm going to mix that together and then put it on just like a stain. I like this better than actually working with stains. I know I used some gel stains for a while, but I'm just loving the burnt umber look. And I also have espresso and both of those paint colors I picked up at the Dollar Tree. When I'm doing furniture projects, I definitely work with the proper stains. So I would use something from Verithane or whatever else your hardware store has. But dark walnut in a stain is my favorite. So this burnt umber just works perfectly. I still have a bunch of spindles and bedposts left over from when I took a couple of beds apart. So what I'm doing here is just counting to make sure I know where the center is. I'm going to place it down and just use my pencil to draw a circle around it so I know exactly where to put the glue. Using the weld bond glue again, this glue is amazing. It's for wood, glass, ceramic, tile, plastic, you name it, it's going to work with anything. And this is what I use for my tiered trays. I use this for putting wood together and then if I need to pin it or screw it in, but this is my go-to glue of choice. What you're looking at now is a jar of paint. I needed something heavy to pop on top of the bedpost so I could continue to work with it, but then it would have time to set with the glue. So something heavy on top is always a good idea. I'm just using the same mixture to go ahead and stain the bottom. When you're gluing items together, a good tip for you is to always glue the raw pieces together. So wood to wood, ceramic to ceramic, and then paint afterwards. You're just going to get a much stronger hold. What I'm going to do now is use this stencil to add some embellishments to the top of the riser. I cut this stencil out using my Cricut and I will have it available on my website. It's using plastic poster board. If you don't have a Cricut and you can't do something like this, but you'd like to, you could definitely use a stencil burner. They're about 20 to $25. I'll have a link for my stencil burner down in the description box. This stencil, along with many others, is also available on my website. So the link will be down in my description box. Go ahead and click on that and you'll be able to see all of the stencils that I offer. For projects like this, when I just want to add a little bit of embellishment, I always use the stencil not full. So you can see that I just let it kind of hang off the one corner. And the reason I do that is because it makes it look more high end and professional. You don't always have to use the stencil in its full capacity. For example, here I'm only using the top portion of it. And then I will also add a little bit into the other corner as well. I wanted to give this a little bit of distressing, so I'm just using the same makeup sponge and I'm only loading it a tiny little bit with some paint and I'm just going to dab it around the edge just to give this a little bit more of a rustic look. Here's where I added the other little bit. This project is using some scrap pieces of wood. I actually only had to cut one of them and those spindles that you see. Now, I'm not sure where those spindles came from. They might have been from a table or a chair. I'm not sure. But anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and glue all of these pieces together first, and then I'm going to pin them with my nailer. The type of glue I'm using today is Gorilla Glue, but it's very similar to E6000. And if you've ever worked with E6000, you know that you need to either clamp the pieces together and let them fully dry overnight, or you need to use something else like hot glue to kind of hold it together temporarily while the glue has a chance to set. What I'm going to do, as I mentioned earlier, is use my nailer to pin them all together. 
Now I'm working on the wheel. This is a round coaster that comes in a pack of four from the Dollar Tree. I'm just adding some tiny little pieces of wood just to make the center portion a little bit thicker so it will stay nice and snug in between the two spindles. I've wiggled the wheel in between the spindles. You can see here, I'm just kind of wedging it in, getting it into the position I want, and then I'm just gonna put a load of hot glue there just to secure it in place. Yes, you'll see the hot glue, but I'm not concerned about that. I'm going to paint it later. I want the wheel to be brown like the spindle, so I'm just using some acrylic paint in somewhat of a matching color, and I'm just gonna give this one coat. It's going to look like it's been stained. Here you can see how I put the spindles together. They're on the bottom of my little box and I just pin them in and then I use the ends of two other spindles, cut them down a little bit shorter to make the little support legs at the back. At first I thought I was going to leave the wheelbarrow rustic, but then I decided I think I need to paint it white. And I'm glad I did because I think it complements the dark brown of the handles and the wheel much better. So just a coat of white chalk paint. You could use latex paint or acrylic paint. This type of wood is a fence board and it just soaks everything in really well. I wanted to make it a little bit more farmhouse looking. So instead of leaving it plain, I'm gonna go ahead and add this leaf stencil. This is something that I created on my Cricut and I will see if I can have it as a free printable for you down in my description box. I'm just using a makeup sponge to apply some black paint and because the grooves in these boards are really deep, it comes out really pretty. I just love the distressed look of this. If this is your first time visiting my channel, welcome. I'm so glad you decided to click on my video. If this is what you like and you want to see more, I would love it if you could hit that red subscribe button and stick around a while. Now I have three more spindles that are a little bit longer and this wood round that I picked up at my local Dollarama. It was a sign. I sanded the paper off as much as I needed to. And now I'm going to use the same glue to pre-glue these in place. And I let them set for a good hour before I did anything else with them. Once I was able to flip it over without the little legs falling off, I used my nailer to hold it in place. Now, if you don't have a nailer, you could definitely pre-drill some holes and just add a screw. Make sure that you sink it below the level of the wood circle because then you can just add a little bit of wood filler or some spackle and smooth out the top. So I'm back inside now and this is what this stand or stool or whatever you want to call it, little mini table, looks like upside down with the spindles on. I am using some black paint and this is folk art multi-surface paint. It's just what I happen to have on hand. It covers really, really well, but it doesn't stick to slick surfaces very well. So later on, it when you see me working with this paint and another project, you're going to see some of the paint kind of come off the spindles because they still, of course, have all their varnish. But for this project, it's perfect. I'm going to go ahead and paint the whole thing, top and bottom, in black. Originally, I thought I was going to paint it all white and then distress it back to the black and some of the brown on the spindles, but I decided to change things up and I'm just going to be painting the very top of this white so in hindsight i didn't need to paint the top of it black but oh well that's how it happens when you're crafting your mind kind of changes as you go once the paint was completely dry again i am using a stencil for this this is a french script stencil with some type of stamp on it and i picked it up on amazon if i can find it again i will link it for you down in my description box and again i'm just using a makeup sponge and some black paint and i'm going to go ahead and stencil the whole thing on and i think this turned out absolutely gorgeous i really love this one Thank you. 
I found this beautiful hummingbird. I think it's supposed to be some type of feeder that you would hang on your wall. It's super heavy and I think it's made out of concrete I think anyway it's just really heavy what I'm doing here is adding some Gorilla Glue and some hot glue to a chunky spindle that I already attached to a wood round and now I'm going to just let this set and cure for at least a couple of hours before I touch it again Here's what it looks like all put together. And I decided to try and mimic the same kind of colors and tones of the hummingbird little stand there. So I'm gonna start by painting the bottom portion gray. This is sort of a medium tone gray and I could already tell by putting this on that it was really not the same shade of gray or even the tone. My color is a little bit more blue and the other one is a little bit more I don't know what you would call it. But anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and finish painting this up and then use some different colors to dry brush and make it look a little bit similar. I'm starting out with some white paint just to lighten it up a little bit and I'm going to go up the spindle portion as well. Then I decided to use a little bit of a green eucalyptus kind of color. This does have a little bit of a green tone to it so adding that color kind of made it blend in a little bit better. The last thing I did was just add a little bit more of the gray. Some of the green went on a little heavier than I wanted, so I'm just blending it all in a little bit more. I think this turned out absolutely gorgeous, and it is a beautiful piece just to display just as is. Here's a quick picture of the Gorilla Glue that I'm using. It's called Clear Grip. I'm going to be, of course, creating some candlesticks. I don't think any spindle video would be complete without some type of candlesticks. I'm going to go ahead and take these chunky white ones with some of the Gorilla Glue and just put them onto these four by fours. These are two by fours cut in four inch by four inch pieces. I found a pack of these saucers. I'm not sure what they would have been used for, probably little appetizer dishes, but I'm gonna go ahead and glue those to the top of this candlestick. And that will be the holder for either a candle or a floral arrangement or whatever you want to put on the top. This pair of candlesticks is going to stay white, but I did need to give the already painted portion at least one coat because my color of white was a little bit different than what was already on the spindle. So just one full coat with some chalk paint, it gives it really good coverage, especially on that raw wood. For this pair of candlesticks, I'm going to be using some rounds and these I got at Michael's. So these are just the plain ones, but I have seen these at the Dollar Tree sometimes. Mine just don't happen to be carrying them anymore. These smaller ones have a little bit of a mitered or beveled edge. I'm not sure what you would call that. I'm going to glue those two together and that's just going to make a nice bottom piece for the spindle. Again, I'm just using the glue and then I'm going to use my nailer to nail everything together. I painted these black using the same folk art multi-surface paint. It is in a satin finish. It's the only finish it's available in. So you can see a little bit of shine happen in there. I'm okay with that because I'm going to be going and putting this antiquing wax on top of it and then wiping off the excess. That will dull the shine down a little bit and it will also give it a beautiful old and deep rich black look. When it came to doing the spindle portion, I did get a little bit of the black paint coming off when I was wiping off the antiquing wax. 
I'm okay with that because I thought it gave it more of a rustic look. But if you would prefer to have the solid black underneath, then I would suggest you sealing it first before you put the antique wax. You could do that with some clear wax or some matte clear spray, whatever you happen to have on hand. But I really love how this turned out. For this second project, I'm starting off with a base piece of wood that is a two by six that I cut square using my miter saw. Then I'm going to use a two by four and I've cut that square as well. So the bottom piece is six by six inches and the top piece is four by four inches. I started by screwing in from the bottom first so I could attach the two together. Then I realized once I had these two attached that I needed to put the spindle on the smaller piece first. Anyway, I ended up having to pull it all apart and start over, but basically you're gonna be attaching the spindle to the two by four, and then you'll be attaching the spindle and the two by four to the two by six. And I used screws for all of this, but I did need to pre-drill a hole in the spindle because the, that wood is really hard. This is the spindle I'm using. It's left over from one of the bed frames that I took apart last year. I've got the spindle all put together and now I'm going to show you what I'm putting on top. I am going to screw in this white and black enamel colander that I got at the thrift store for $2.99. I was super excited when I saw this because I knew exactly what I wanted to do with it. First, I'm going to need to drill another hole in the top of the spindle and I'm using a drill bit that's a little bit smaller than the screw I'm going to use. I'm going to go in fairly deep because I want to make sure that this is nice and secure. Now, even though the colander has holes at the bottom, the hole isn't big enough for me to fit the screw in that I would like to use. So I'm taking a metal drill bit that's quite a bit larger than my screw and I'm just popping it through the hole that was already there. Now make sure when you're wanting to get away any of the shavings, these are metal, they can cut you. So just be very careful when you're drilling with metal. And now my screw fits in there perfectly. Now all that's left is to put these two pieces together and hanging on to the spindle because it's going to start to spin in just a second. There it goes. So I've got to hang on really tight and then just put my screw right down using my impact driver. And I really love how this is turning out. While I was still outside, I gave the spindle one coat of spray paint, not a full coat as you can see. Some of the wood is still coming through and that's all right because I'm just gonna take some of my chalk paint and give it a rough coat. I do want some of those dark pieces to show, especially because the spindle has so many grooves in it. And then I don't even have to distress it, it's already distressed. I really love how this turned out and I can't wait for the weather to get even better so I can put some live plants in it and put it out on my front porch. For this project, I'm going to be using some more of my spindles. I've already attached these with my nail gun to the bases. What I'm doing now is just drilling all the way through from one end to the other, about an inch or so from the top, making sure that it goes all the way through and the hole is nice and clean. You might recognize these little windmills. I did a windmill project like this a while back, but these are the windmills from the Dollar Tree. Those are the little stakes that you get and they have a little welcome sign underneath them. I took them all apart and I gave them a couple of coats of white spray paint. Using some cutters, I'm going to take this little stake and just cut a length, probably about four inches. 
then I'm going to be taking it and bending it. And why I'm doing that is because I want it to be locked into the top part of the spindle. So first I'm just bending it somewhat into a 90 degree angle so I can fit it into the hole. Putting the windmill on the little wire and then pushing it through, I'm going to leave it about a half an inch from the spindle. And that will give me enough space to just trim off a little bit more of this wire and bend it so the windmill doesn't fall off. I still want the windmill to be able to spin as you can see me doing here. So I'm just judging to make sure I have enough space for it to do that. I figured out that an inch and a half would be enough so I'm just going to be cutting off some of the excess. Then I'm going to fit the windmill blades back on and then bend the wire down. Now I ended up changing that and turning it around so the wire was bent up and that ensured that the blades would stay in place. Once I had it bent up enough, I was able to just give it a little bit of a squeeze and close it up, sort of like an eye hook. And you can see that result there and it's spinning just great. The next thing I'm going to do is just take the back piece and bend that one over a little bit too, and that will hold everything secure. Once everything was put together, I took the windmills back inside and using my kitchen sponge again and some medium gray paint, I'm just going to distress the outside edges just to make them look a little old and worn out. I'm also going to take that sponge along the bottom of the spindle itself, the actual plank that it's sitting on just to give that a little bit more distressing too. I just used whatever paint was left on the sponge and dragged it across making sure to hit the edges a little bit more than the rest of it. This is the welcome portion of those little Dollar Tree signs and while I was outside I did spray paint them white and now I'm just distressing them a little bit more with the leftover paint that's on this little sponge. You guys will have to let me know. I decided not to put these little signs on the windmills but I'm thinking now that maybe I'll give it a try with one of them and just see how it looks. So you let me know in the comments if you think I should add these welcome signs to the windmills. The way they are right now, I am in love and these will be heading out to the St. Jacob's store this week. While I was working on all of these spindles, I ended up just putting a whole bunch of them together, putting different bases on them and just deciding how I wanted everything to look. I didn't want to take you through that each time because it is very similar. So now I'm using my weld bond glue and what I'm going to be putting on top of these spindles are these two little canisters. I can't seem to find the picture of how these looked before I spray painted them white, but they were blue and they had ducks on them. So I'm going to just go ahead and make sure that you can't see anything of the ducks. The spray paint covered it a little bit, but I'm going to need to do a little bit more texturizing on these to make sure that they are camouflaged. I'm using my chalk paint just to go over this spindle and I'm going to give it a very rough coat because I want some of that wood grain and texture to show through. This is one that I just totally forgot to spray paint outside and that's what they look like. When you spray paint them you get a lot of that wood grain showing through and a little bit of the original color and that's what I like. Earlier I mentioned that you could still see a little bit of the outline of the ducks so I'm using some regular latex house paint in white and I'm going to put, add some baking soda and then give it lots of texture. I'm going to give the canisters two coats and that is just going to camouflage any little indentations from the ducks that were there before. To give these a little bit more of an enamel look or maybe more of a distressed look, I'm using some gray chalk paint and just a little makeup sponge. And I'm just gonna go around the edges like you see me doing here, just the top and the bottom. And that's just gonna give them a little more character. 
these little spindle canisters are really fun. Let me know if you think I should put some type of label on them or just leave them plain white. And what would you put inside these little canisters? Florals, of course, are always the standby, but I'd like to think outside the box a little bit and see what else you guys can come up with to help me put in these canisters. I love using spindles in home decor and garden decor, and I'm going to be using this solar light and attaching it to the spindle. The first thing I need to do is figure out what size of spade bit I need to drill into the top of the spindle. Spade bits give you a much bigger hole, which is perfect for this project. What I'm going to need to do is make sure that the bit is just a little bit larger than the bottom of the solar light because I want to be able to wedge it in and not have to use any glue. The top of these spindles already have somewhat of a little hole there so that's the perfect spot for me to start doing the spade bit. It would be great if I was able to wedge this spindle in something so I could use two hands to push my drill down, but it seemed to work out okay. What I'm going to do now is just test the hole to make sure that it is the right size for the solar lantern, and it definitely is. I'm just going to need to make it a little bit deeper so it can go all the way down. I drilled in another quarter of an inch or so, and now it fits perfectly. What I'm doing here is creating a base for each of the spindles. I'm going to do two of them. I'm pre-drilling a hole for my deck screw because I don't want this wood to split. It was an old deck board and it's really dry. So I wanted to make sure that I don't crack the board by accident. So what I'm going to do now is also do the same thing by drilling a pilot hole into the spindle. Spindles are really, really hard wood and you definitely can't get a screw in there without doing a pilot hole first. I like to start my screw into the bottom piece first and then I push it through a little bit on the other side so I can very easily find the pilot hole in the spindle and make sure I'm going in the right spot. I'm going to be able to fit that screw right into my pilot hole and then start putting it all together. It would have been really great if I would have had an extra set of hands here, but I didn't, so I ended up making it work, even though it was a little tough to get it started. I did have to double check the position of the spindle. It was a little off kilter at first, so then I just made sure that I made it straight. So standing it up here and just kind of twisting it a little bit just to make it straight. Then I'm going to take this spindle down to the ground here and countersink the screw, which means I want it to be below the level of the wood and that will prevent it from wobbling. I didn't realize when I first bought these lights that they were actually a flickering flame. And I think that is so cool. Take a look at this, how it's flickering. It's going to look so neat outside in the dark. At first I thought I was going to paint the spindles black to match the solar lanterns, but then I thought, you know what, white would look really nice against the black. So I'm just giving them a couple of coats of regular white latex paint. This is an interior paint, but you know what, latex paint is really tough. And if it weathers a little bit when it's outside, that's okay, because I like that look. I have these old tins that came from my cottage. One is a little wobbly and it has a hole in it. The other one is okay. What I'm going to do is add some wood pieces to the bottom of the buckets just to raise up my spindle pieces a little taller. They would have fit right down at the bottom, but then they wouldn't be very tall and you wouldn't see a lot of the spindle itself. So I'm just going to finagle around and see what kind of arrangement I can make to have the spindles stand up straight. Mm -hmm. 
Now I'm going to fill the buckets, not all the way to the top, but just to cover the wood pieces with some pea gravel. This is some gravel that we had left over from when we took our pool down. We had pea gravel all around the edges of the above ground pool and we decided to save it because, hey, you can always use some pea gravel. I set both of the pots on either side of this little half circle garden that I created when we took our pool down. I've got some vegetable boxes and some lavender and a whole bunch of different things in here and it's just absolutely beautiful. I'm just making sure that my solar lights fit in here and are turned on and then they'll be good to go. The second project I have for you, I think turned out amazing, but you'll have to let me know what you think. I'm taking two pieces of scrap wood and I've cut them in similar sizes, but of course one smaller than the other. So the first thing I'm going to do is just give them a coat of my Rust-Oleum chalk paint in the color Cocoa Bean. I was lucky enough to score a beautiful bed frame on the side of the road, which I took apart and I've got a whole bunch of different pieces. And that's what I'm gonna to use to create the tiered tray that I'm working with right now. I'm going to just put these two pieces together. They're gonna to become the top spindle of the tiered tray. So I'm just gonna hot glue those together and wood on wood with hot glue stands up really well. And then the other thing I'm going to do is glue a little half round wood bead to the top just to cover up the hole in this top piece. I gave the wood look area at the top of this piece a couple of coats of the cocoa bean chalk paint just so it would blend in a little bit more with the rest of it. I'm going to give both of these wood pieces two coats of a DIY chalk paint. It's just white flat latex house paint with some talc. And if you're interested in the recipe, I have it listed down in my description box. I usually mix up a big jug of it and then I'm set for quite a while before I have to make another batch. One thing I like to do is change the direction of my brush strokes on the second coat. That just helps to give me more even coverage. So I'll do a vertical stroke on the first one and then flip the board around and do another vertical stroke or a vertical and a horizontal stroke, however you wanna call it. Just switch directions for your second coat and you'll get much better coverage that way. I've got four of these wood riser feet that are going to be the bottom of my tray and I'm just going to pre-drill a hole for the screw. I'm going to do that for all four pieces plus the middle section that's going to be the support for the top and the bottom. You'll want to have your drill bit a little bit smaller than the size of your screw because then it'll have some grip when you're screwing it in. Otherwise, it'll be too loose. I could have used a smaller one for this, so I did have to use a little bit of glue in a few spots to make sure that it would stay secure. To attach the riser feet, I'm going to be screwing from the top of the board all the way down through the board and then into the riser holes that I pre-drilled. So here I'm just marking out where I want them to be. I'm gonna mark about an inch in from the side and the top, and then I'll have them set in the same spot in all four corners. I'm using a piece of scrap wood underneath my board to make sure that I don't drill into my desk, but also it will let me know when I'm all the way through the wood. I'm going to screw the screws in almost all of the way. I just want a little bit sticking out of the bottom so I have an easier way of getting it in the right hole on the riser feet. Then I can just place the riser foot right into the little part of the screw that is sticking out and finish screwing them together. I should have added a little bit of wood glue to all of these pieces because I did have one that was a little bit loose. So I would suggest doing that 
add a little bit of wood glue or some type of glue. I am always using my weld bond glue and that will just give you an extra secure hold. I'm also sinking the screws in a little bit farther down so they're really into the wood good and they don't stick out too much. I flipped it over and now I'm starting from the bottom and putting a screw in through to the top because this will then support the middle spindle posts that I need for the tray. It's really easy to get these two pieces together because I've got the pre-drilled holes in the spindle. I'm going to repeat the process for the top level of the tray, which is the smaller piece of wood. I'm going to put a screw right through it and then attach it to the spindle. Using a screwdriver, I'm just pulling away some of the paint on the very top level. I'm going to just use my weld bond glue to glue the top spindle in place. The glue will be sufficient because there isn't any support needed for this. It's just a decorative piece. Using some fine grit sandpaper, I'm just going to sand around the edges and the corners of all the boards just to pull off some of that white paint and show the brown underneath. That's the reason why I painted it brown. I wanted that reveal to have a blending effect with the spindles because I'm leaving the spindles their brown color as well. I wanted to camouflage the screws on the bottom shelf, so I'm taking some of these half round beads and I'm staining them with a dark walnut gel stain. I'm going to add the beads just using hot glue and placing them right on top of the screw to hide it. I'm going to do the same thing on the top. I am over the moon in love with this tiered tray and I think this one's definitely going to be a keeper. I hope you enjoyed my Timber Tuesday DIYs and got inspired to work with wood yourself. If you liked my video, please give me a thumbs up. That tells YouTube you did like it and they promote it. The more first wood. project I have for you today is using part of this wood bed frame. I cut a whole bunch of bed frames down into different size spindles. And what I'm trying to do here is create a V cut in the center. I used my table saw. I, just to get some initial cuts, I'm trying to use this little hacksaw and I'm going to use some needle nose pliers to try and pick out those pieces of wood. But I ended up going back out to my garage and using this multi tool with all these accessories. I was able to cut in on an angle and that one got the job done. Now I'm using these two pieces of scrap wood cut into squares. The bottom one is a two by six and the top one is a two by four. I'm going to glue them together using weld bond glue. This glue is so amazing. It is like totally solid when you glue things together. This is my favorite glue to use. I use it instead of using a wood glue and then a crazy glue. This is an all purpose glue that will put anything together. I'm also adding just a little bit of hot glue so I can continue to work on this piece while the weld bond glue dries. This is another piece of spindle from the same bed. I'm going to do the same thing with it. Use some weld bond glue and some hot glue and then glue it down right into the center of the blocks. This is a birdhouse that I got on clearance at Michael's. I'm going to glue that on top of the spindle. I need to balance this, so I'm taking a couple of these tumbling tower blocks on either side of the peak. I have the birdhouse sitting upside down and this will help me get it in the center. I don't trust myself to be able to take the birdhouse and place it in the center on top of the spindle, so I'm gonna do it the other way around. This is what the project looks like so far. I've had success gluing the birdhouse right on top of the spindle. Here's a really close up look at that V that I cut out of the wood. What I need to do is make sure that that can sit on top of the birdhouse. That's why I cut out the V. I'm making a double birdhouse tool. 
apiary. And I thought this would be a really cute idea to have on my front porch. So the same thing, I'm gonna take my weld bond glue and hot glue and then just center it as best I can. And I believe I used a little bamboo skewer just to make sure that it was going to be straight. The spindle is dry and I've already prepped it on top with some more weld bond glue and hot glue so I can stick on the second birdhouse. Now it's time to paint. I'm going to do the base of the birdhouse in white. I'm also going to do the birdhouse bodies in white. Here you can see that the main body of the birdhouse is painted white. I did the small one as well. Now I'm just going to dry brush some white chalk paint over the brown spindle. I like the brown look, but for this I wanted to do something a little bit different. And I didn't want to sand anything down, I just wanted to give it more of an aged look. I'm going to paint the base of the birdhouse and the roof in Eucalyptus by Martha Stewart Vintage Chalk Paints. I got this on clearance at Michael's just after the holidays and I really love this color. The other color on the birdhouse above it is going to be Rust-Oleum Chalk Paint in Serenity Blue and I'm going to do the base and the roof as well. Of course, I have to also distress the base of this. So I'm using some dark walnut gel stain and I've just got it in a little bowl here and I'm using a dry brush method to just put on a little bit and then I'll add more if I feel it needs it. Then I decided that the gel stain was a little too brown. I'm trying to stay away from browns because I just painted the candlestick, which was brown, a different color. So I'm going ahead with some dark gray chalk paint over the white, and that just helps to make it look even more old and weathered. I also decided to take some of the gray and go over the white a little bit. It was looking a little too stark white on the candlestick, so I'm just going to add a little bit more dimension to that as well. Of course, since everything on this piece is distressed, I also had to distress the rooftops. I'm taking a small little chip brush with a little bit of white chalk paint and just dragging it from top to bottom, giving it a little bit of distressing. I am head over heels for this birdhouse topiary, and I hope you like it too. DIY number two is using the drawer from this taters and onion box. I spent a whole bunch of time out in my garage this past weekend working on just painting up some wood items. So I'm giving this two good coats of my white latex house paint. This is the front of the drawer and I just love these little buttons. I think it gives it a lot of character. I'm just gonna take some fine grit sandpaper and sand off some of the white so you can see some of the darker wood underneath. Quite a while back, I took apart some bed frames and this is one of the bed posts from the headboard. It's got this little piece of wood that just doesn't wanna come out. So I'm gonna take a couple of little saws and just do my very best to cut it off. I also sanded down the leg quite a bit just using a fine grit sandpaper I wanted to get some of the shine off and that would also help to clean it. I also then went down a little bit to the bare wood in some spots you can see that here so the gel stain that I'm using which is by Verithane in the color dark walnut and that would just show up so much nicer than the reddish brown it was to begin with. I'm going to leave the stain on for a good hour till it's almost fully dry and then I'm going to take another clean cloth and just buff it down. 
This is a piece of two by six that I had in my garage. It was actually a scrap wood piece that I picked up at my local hardware store. Make sure you go and ask them in the cutting section. They're always doing cuts for people and there's always stuff left over. And usually you can get it for a super good price. I think I paid $3 for like 10 pieces of all of these. And I know in some hardware stores, you can even get them cheaper than that. So I'm using the same same gel stain and I'm going to use the same rag, just put it on pretty heavily and then let it dry. The dark walnut on the raw piece of wood looked a little different than the actual bed post. So I decided just to take my cocoa bean chalk paint, which is a beautiful rich brown, and just do some dry brushing on it to give it just a bit of a deeper color. I'm going to use a different way of putting these together. These are called wood screw stud pins. They look like a screw, but there's no head on them. And that allows you to screw it down into a piece of wood and then screw another piece of wood on top. I'm going to go ahead and drill the size of the screw down into the two by six, and then I'll do the same for the wood post. So I'm going to screw the bottom portion into the two by six, and then I'm going to take the bed post and screw that on top. I'm also going to use some weld bond glue to make sure that both pieces of wood are securely fastened to each other with the screw, but also with the wood glue. That'll just make sure that it has a really good hold. I'm going to drill a hole in the top of the bed post so it fits my screw and I'll also do the same thing for the bottom of the drawer. Then I can screw them both together and I have a gorgeous plant stand. Thanks so much for spending some time with me today. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. That black arrow will show you exactly where to click. Hit the like button and the notification bell so you don't miss out on anything else I have to share. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.